guy. Yeah. Is, he working that, the, is he working on the new Cosmos? Uh, he's, I don't know that. Uh, no, no. The director says go for it. You're running, right? Yeah. Okay, let me get this going. Okay, yeah. now it's going. And then that'll give us a fix on the time. Yeah. Okay, um, five, four, three, two, one. Welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversations. Pleasure to welcome to the program. Um, David McConnell, and he's a, a person who's interested in things in a very large dimension. We both have an interest in the person of, and the contributions of Buckminster Fuller and other comprehensivists who have tried to understand things in that very large tableau. He's doing very interesting work, and we're going to be talking about that. And David, welcome to New York and to Conversations Thanks very so much. Thanks so much, Appreciate it. Really quickly, if you can go over your background, you're born and raised, that sort of thing, a little of the education, and then there's a lot of important questions we'd want to deal with, but could you just go over that and we'll wait, wait in? Sure. Uh, I was born and raised in the American Southeast, various cities, primarily in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in Asheville, North Carolina for the past 20 years or so, mm -hmm. um, home base, travel quite a bit. Um, and I moved there originally for university when I was studying with uh, Dr. Robert Moog, the oh, yeah. inventor of the analog synthesizer. Right. And a lot of that really started me down the path that I'm on now mm -hmm. um, with my interest in perception mm -hmm. and how it is that we can utilize technology to really augment, enhance perception so that we can perceive things beyond our everyday awareness. And you were drawn to Moog because you were interested in things that had preceded that. You were, you're, you're, the things that were of interest to you brought you to Mr. Moog. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, since I was very, very young, I yeah. was a, a fan of music, but okay. also yeah. the, the ways of manipulating perception with music. Okay. And so as an undergraduate, I was studying with him uh -huh. a lot of the, the nature of what synthesis was and how it was that we would develop relationships with electronics and how yeah, and we it, could start to tweak our perceptions right. based on these sensory extensions that we have, yeah, yeah. which really led me into a lot of the work that I'm doing now, right. um, dealing with ways of using technologies for helping to expand the notions of what the universe and the cosmos is. So is it fair to say you came in from music? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's yeah. really in the Moog synthesizer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You may not be some familiar with that, or even the Kurzweil also, yeah. who is another person who understands cybernetics from yeah. that perspective, right? Absolutely, yeah, and, and Moog worked with Kurzweil for quite some time. So. Yeah, right, and that's, so that's where you came in from. Mm. Do you ever do music yourself? Um, I'm more behind the scenes right. with the music. Okay. I really yeah. enjoy yeah. the engineering aspect of it. Uh -huh. I haven't actually done it much in years because I skipped a number of frequencies and I deal mostly with light now. Uh -huh. so, okay, so yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan and I'm, I'm uh, constantly using audio to enhance experiences, but I don't uh, kind of actively participate in the music scene. Yeah, and you're, really, you, you're becoming very interested in multimedia, if that's the term. Yeah. And you've also had an interest, in, would say here for a public access audience, you have some association with the importance of and the significance significance of uh, uh, public access cable television programming that's part of the pattern. Right, right. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a number of years ago, I helped to get a public access station on the air in uh -huh. my hometown, uh -huh. um, but it was part of a larger effort, uh, an organization that I helped to found called the Media Arts Project, the right. MAP, uh -huh. which was really looking at how it is we can use public uh, channels for media uh, to enhance our capacity for communication and how it is. I mean, and a lot of this really stemmed from early work that I was doing in the 90s um, with online media and, and internet radio. When I was a, a graduate student at Chapel Hill, yeah. I helped to put the first internet radio station online. Good for and you. My, my interest was really in what does it mean to democratize media so that we can start to have access in various forms mm -hmm. uh, to distribution, to different production capacities. Right. Um, this is all stuff that kind of led to where I am now, which is, yeah. which we'll get to, but it's yeah. actually, it's, it's, it's related, but it's a, it's a thread that um, I would have to kind of uh, paint yeah, in no. order to understand, you know, what, what all of this has to do with the ways in which we understand the universe. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, that's a life pattern, goes yeah, like yeah, that. You, you start out, you know, at a youthful age and then you get into things. Yeah. That's very interesting and it's very, very important. When did you pick up on, uh, I guess relatively recently, on the significance of uh, Buckminster Fuller? Um, well, when I moved to Asheville, I first learned about Black Mountain College. Yeah, it was wonderful. And um, where Fuller taught uh -huh. um, in the late 40s mm -hmm. for the summer sessions there. 
And I became increasingly interested in a lot of the interactions that were going on with various characters there. Merce um, Cunningham. Merce Cunningham, yeah. John Cage, yeah. Fuller was there, Stan Vanderbeek, Kenneth yeah. Nelson. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and there were a number of writers and poets. There were people, Al, uh, Joseph and Annie Albers, you know, working across all of these different disciplines. Yeah. Um, but in a very transdisciplinary way, really. Mm -hmm. And so my interest in Fuller came about after actually I'd been working with uh, domes for a number of years. When yeah. I left undergraduate and I went to grad school, I, I started, uh, I, I found a group that was doing work with dome projection systems okay. in the mid 90s. Yeah. And so I became increasingly interested in domes as uh -huh. a way uh, or a space within which we could uh, project both sound and light right, to right. have kind of collective experiences. Right. Uh, and yeah. of course, Fuller came up immediately yeah. <laughs> and that, that also that research. yeah and that also leads you into the planetarium yeah realm. precisely well, you work right? with carter and mark yeah a lot, exactly right? which yeah, is a carter great guy that Dominion kind of history. stuff and yeah. that's something that's all coming and it's all coming exponential it seems to me all near uh, exponential the capability to have multimedia projection if you think it in the long sweep of human history yeah yeah well it's we've been we've always done it i mean we've always projected our imaginations onto the perceived dome of the sky Right? Okay, and yeah. the ways in which we interpret that dome has, has established human civilization. If you think about the, the architectural structures of Islamic mosques and, uh -huh. and Buddhist stupas and Christian cathedrals and Indian sweat lodges and a number of you know, African lodges and, and igloos, I mean, the, these are all representations of the ways in which we're interpreting the cosmos mm -hmm. and embedding them within this kind of archetypal architecture. Uh -huh. And so my interest in Fuller was really the ways in which he was playing at this nexus of trying to understand fundamental geometries that are functioning within the universe, uh -huh. as well as the ways in which we could be using the dome form itself to reproject so that we could reflect back on what our own perceptions are. Oh, really good. So the educational implications of that are staggering, yeah, are absolutely. they not? I yeah. mean, particularly now. Yeah, absolutely. And the, 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 uh, the dome or the... Uh, Planetarium might be, uh, it's like a video display screen, is that fair to say? Sure. Yeah. The planetarium, yeah. and it's advanced, and with exponential decreasing in cost mm. with the computing, uh, it's going to become more ubiquitous than it has been. It was very limited to a few who would have access to that technologically, right. but it could become right into the realm of everyday life. Right. As a way of educating, sure. maybe you could think of it that way. Sure. Also, you said you were near Memphis. You, uh, he was at Southern, Univer Southern U Illinois University, Southern Illinois, yeah. Carbondale. Yeah, he did a lot of work there, yep. and a lot of the uh, design science decade work mm -hmm. he did, 65, 75, is significant in terms of trying to understand the overall yeah. development of human culture, Absolutely. is it not? That's where he was doing a lot of the, the database and aggregation of human trends and needs all over the world, uh -huh. and was really beginning to quantify you know, how it is that we could achieve, I think, what his students called the bare maximums for humanity. Okay, you know? right, like, okay, well, that's a good term. Yeah, yeah, isn't yeah. It? I, I love yeah. that word. Yeah. Um, but how could we really begin to uh, structure human society, design the future in such a way yeah. that we could be working with synergistic forces so that we could provide for 100% of humanity? Yeah. I mean, and so, like, uh, with my own path, becoming interested in domes and discovering the work, because Black Mountain was where uh, he first started constructing uh, his first attempt at a geodesic dome. One of them is the Supine Dome. The Supine Dome, <laughs> exactly, exactly, made out of Venetian yeah. blinds. Well, um, but some of his students, mm. most notably Stan Vanderbeek, yeah. was very influenced, who ended up doing some very early experiments with dome film in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. um, and, all, and a lot of my interest in this has really gotten me to dig into the history of dome projection uh -huh. and dating all the way back to the 1930s. But 30. even okay, yeah, uh, even for yeah, actually yeah. the the founder of Cinerama did a, a World's Fair exhibit in 1939 here in New York. No kidding. Um, yeah. Where did the, the World's Fair? Yeah. With the American Museum of Natural History, okay. it was a tour through the universe that was precisely what Carter has been doing yes, at the indeed. American Museum of Natural History, indeed, right? Indeed. But this was forgotten history. Yeah, right. So it's so I, I'm really intrigued by what is it about this dome form mm -hmm. that is compelling us to want to break beyond. This, this firmament you well, know, within our imaginations, that it seems to be some type of drive that we have yeah. to try to expand our awareness out beyond you know, our immediate perception. That's true, that's been there, they've been there for a while, but it's also a thing 
where you, if you walk through the world, you don't experience the world as a little slit in reality like right. television. Right. You experience it as a surround. Yeah. And the planetariums are the closest to that. I guess holography is over the horizon mm -hmm. or something. But that's a way in which you could have shows that are projected upon a planetarium context where you would be surrounded by an event. And that could be used for not only space questions like the universe mm -hmm. and so forth, like planetariums, but it could be a uh, feature film sure. or, or, or documentaries or sure. something that would be uh, available to people. And that's something that seems over the horizon when we get the cost down to where it could become part of the general society. Is that a possibility or is that too far in the future? No, I think it's think? already, I mean, it, just in terms of the theaters, there's already hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that have been constructed in the past 10 years. I mean, mm. they're, they're, it's becoming pretty commonplace in science uh -huh. centers. Uh -huh. um, and, and by the way, Fuller called that, that the omnidirectional television. Thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> when right. he was talking about That's human right. consciousness and perception, the ways yeah. in which we're getting all of these inputs and these signals right. of perception, he, he immediately recognized the omnidirectional nature of what it is that we were perceiving. Yes, indeed. And even when you try to take panoramic photographs or you even look at the cosmic microwave background mm. yeah. or you look at you know, the dome of the sky, yeah. it's just kind of all of these nested spheres right. because we are each located at, the center, at our observational center. Is it right? a, I don't want to get off on this too much, but mm. is it a common... Uh, standard of how that is done in a planetarium. Carter told me you got five going around the radius and then you have a keystone thing and it's mm. a united system. Mm. Is it a united system of projection? There's is there something, are there distinct differences one country to another? Are there standards, mm. conversions or connections of this way of having uh, projecting uh, reality, uh, multimedia reality, right. or what is the reality there in terms of the possibility of a system that would be united around the world, like electricity? Sure. Well, the commonality is spherical perspective. Okay. So since the time of the Renaissance, mm -hmm. um, the Western world has been you know, really entrained to think in the context of linear perspective, oh, right? Yeah. This was a major sort of perceptual revolution when linear perspective was introduced and yeah. then we had camera obscura being used yeah, right. increasingly and that yeah. really established this whole notion of the divide between the observer and the observed okay. which really lent itself within the, sci the, the modern scientific paradigm yeah. to think in terms of an objective observer. Mm -hmm. And so we were being perceptually entrained in some regard. And we got foreshortened perspective. Ex exactly. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, and so yeah. when you- The vanishing point. The vanishing point, yeah, precisely. Right. Yeah. And so that represents single point linear perspective. Okay. And what domes do in the kind of current manifestation is project essentially a, f a five point perspective, yeah. which is you know, basically cardinal directions and, and straightforward uh -huh. um, onto a, a hemisphere mm -hmm. so that it more closely mimics the ways in which we actually perceive. It's right. right, and it's multi-sensorial. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, and yeah. so the, the, the technical Un, un, underpinning of these systems, they're all different. I mean, yeah. my company manufactures uh, fisheye projection systems. Okay, yeah, right. right. So That's we use around. one projector with one yeah. lens, right. but at, at AMNH, at the Hayden Planetarium, they use multiple projectors. None of that really matters because ultimately they all conform to this, this specification okay. of spherical perspective. That is important yeah. to get down. Isn't absolutely. It? At yeah, an engineering are, level. Absolutely. Yeah, there are right. a number of people that have been working on standards for years and years and years yeah. to make sure that all these systems can interoperate and work together. We had that problem with some of the various videotape sets. Yeah, you know, exactly. All these kind of yeah, things is that exactly. because there's market competition, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But you've been interested in that for a very long time. You're also now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, president of the board or involved with the Buckminster Fuller yeah, Institute. Yeah, president of the institute. Might absolutely. be well worth talking about that because that's a major institution in terms of intellectually understanding the human prospect in a very comprehensivist mode. Sure. And Mr. Fuller, or there were others, but Mr. Fuller was particularly adept at. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, my, my interest in the work of Fuller and the <coughs> Buckminster Fuller Institute yeah. really derives from my own attempts to understand and visualize different notions of the universe and trying to think in terms of the largest possible frames. I mean, as Fuller said, you know, if you're trying to solve a problem, start with the universe so that you can yeah. avoid leading out, leaving out any critical variables. Right, right. 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 So right. If, if we're trying to address problems comprehensively, mm -hmm. it's really the antithesis of the way that we've been trained okay. in, in some ways, that we're, yeah. we're trained to be these specialists, you know, yeah. and, and we're constantly... Uh, especially in, in academic settings, yeah. being told we have to get more and more specialized, make arguments that are within these specific fields. And so as I started to work with 
the whole idea of starting with universe? Mm -hmm. And how is it that we could, I mean, is that even possible? How uh -huh. can we work beyond it's disciplines? A, yeah, right. You know, it's, it's yeah. a daunting, daunting question. Yes, it is. And eventually what I came to is that these, these visualization tools are so powerful now yes. so that we can visualize our notions of, across all of these different sciences and we can, you know, with, with the work that Carter has done, you know, scale within a kind of powers of 10 scaling engine to conceptualize phenomena far, far, far beyond our everyday perceptions. Yeah. But I was attracted to the work of BFI specifically because ultimately once you kind of run the course of asking all these big questions and right. conceptualizing and abstracting and trying to grapple with all of this, that for me anyway, this, this pragmatic need hit, mm -hmm. hit me hard. That, that when, we, when, when, when did it, uh, it I would say enter it was, into your consciousness? I would say really it was around 2005. 2005, yeah. relatively recently. Relatively recently, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. And, okay. and, and what, I, what I was attracted to with Fuller's work was mm -hmm. kind of, first it was through all of the sort of interesting proposals that he was making and the ways in which they really manifest within his artifacts, right? Uh -huh. that, his, that there was this drive to demonstrate uh, physically, uh -huh. these metaphysical principles right. to really show the extent to which the physical and the metaphysical really aren't separated. Right. That these are dualisms that we create. And so I became involved with BFI yeah. because there was a, they were just starting a challenge um, called yeah. the Buckminster Fuller Challenge, right, which right. is a $100,000 a year prize mm -hmm. given uh, to a project with the greatest potential to help make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or to the disadvantage of anyone. Love that quote. Right? That's quote. a mission statement. That's, that's a mission statement, yeah. and it's a good intention. It right? is not only it's, a good it's intention, the intention, it's something that ought to be taken into account by everybody, Absolutely. political and otherwise. Absolutely. Yeah, right. I mean, and for me, that it's become a baseline. Yeah, me right? too. Yeah. That, that it's, it's something that if you can get someone to agree to that, then mm -hmm. you can, the, the conversation gets so with. much more interesting. Yeah, you right. You know, because I, th uh, well, it's a tangent. I was <laughs> no, I'm not going to talk about politics, but the, but the the ways in which BFI had started this this program, mm -hmm. and I actually I first got involved in 2006 when we did a what's called a design science lab mm -hmm. in Asheville. It was a 10 day program looking at how it is we apply design science principles, mm -hmm. um, which design science being the framework that Fuller developed uh, that he called comprehensive anticipatory design science. To thank you to understand to create artifacts to rather create than be involved with the uh, and just exhorting people to be good exactly to set up a system where that can emerge you reform the environment of, instead of the people right. right and that was a large part of his life was mm. spent within that context which took no count hardly yeah. at all of the normal political news kind of right, thing that precisely. we deal with yeah but he did toward the end of his life we come out with a couple of books that began to look at that yeah so we might be able to get to that at yeah. some point yeah absolutely but anticipatory design science was what he's associated with for most of his life. Exactly. And mm -hmm. so I, I worked with BFI to host one of these design science labs in Asheville, um, also with Medard Gable, one of his students. Medard um, Gable, yeah, I know. And, yeah. and, um, and that had a profound impact on me. I mean, like, I really started to see this process as being one in which it was actually trying to look at problems from the most comprehensive perspective. Mm -hmm. And this, this was something I hadn't really encountered before. And really looking at it from the cosmological level, the ecological level, you know, from physics and biology and, and sociology. I mean, like every possible lens could be accounted for within this system. And I found it so compelling that I wanted to be uh, wanted to become more involved with BFI. They asked mm. me to be on the board. Mm. And it was just when they were starting this challenge. Uh -huh. And the interesting thing about that for me was that by putting the call out for mm -hmm. projects designed to make the world work for 100% of humanity, mm -hmm. that all of these projects were coming in from yeah. all of these different countries across all of these different disciplines. Uh -huh. And the very process uh -huh. of inviting jurors to come in right. and vetting these projects and really asking yeah. ourselves, what does this mean? Uh -huh. It started to become a very pragmatic endeavor mm -hmm. for working with really some of the most you know brilliant and visionary people on the planet right. to have very intense uh, conversations and mm -hmm. debates even mm -hmm. around how is it that these principles are manifest in the world. Mm -hmm. And one of the key notions with all of that, of course, was is one of synergy, yeah. which is working to realize emergent properties that can't be predicted just by looking 
at uh, uh, the components of a system individually. I think it means synergy. When he would ask those people about synergy to a group of scientists back mm -hmm. in the 50s, uh, nobody would know it's on every ad. But it's, in sense, it's behavior systems unpredictable well, the, the sum, sum of the parts. parts. Exactly. There's something resonatingly yeah. more than the sum of the parts, Absolutely. which gives way toward where you can see things synergistically or holistically or comprehensively. Which again is kind of the antithesis of the reductionist approach. Which is the that, mark the, of a good deal of academia, don't you absolutely. think? Absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah. of, of the entire you know Western scientific endeavor for the most part, yeah. and that we look for answers by trying to pick things apart yeah. and, and looking for all the discrete components. Uh -huh. And that's important. It's given us remarkable capacities from manipulating the physical world. <laughs> yes, but, indeed. But I think that it needs to have some balance, yeah. whereby we start looking beyond disciplines and we start looking beyond the individual discrete parts. Because and we start to try to understand what does it mean to solve problems with the intentionality of making the world work for 100% of humanity, but also to be looking at these you know, sometimes unintended, sometimes intended consequences right. of mm -hmm. the interactions of these complex systems. Yeah, right. And yeah. so my, my involvement with BFI has really been about my, really my need to have examples so that when we're telling stories of global change, yeah. um, when, for instance, you can take people on these, these cosmic tours and you uh, return to the, to the simulations of Earth and you can talk about all of the things going on mm -hmm. with regards to biodiversity loss and chemical pollution and you know ocean acidification and all of these things that are really quite daunting right yeah. i mean like it's impossible for us as individuals in many ways to wrap our heads around right. the implications of all of that yeah but what i've found is that the stories around the types of projects that are coming into the challenge uh -huh. are absolutely the most important grounding for learning about all of these global change Wonderful. issues. Wonderful. What what not only the ones that get the award, but also the, the, the co collective uh, wisdom that's contained within all of the things that are submitted. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and that's really something that I'm focused on since, since becoming president is how can we start to focus on cultivating and incubating all of these other projects that have been submitted so that mm -hmm. we can have a prof this profound community of practice mm -hmm. cultivated and assisted and funded and everything else mm -hmm. so that we can begin to demonstrate mm -hmm. what does it look like to take that type of ethical standing mm -hmm. to, to make the world work for everybody yeah. and apply synergistic approaches mm -hmm. so that we can have very uh, imminently practical and studyable case studies uh -huh. of activities happening on the planet. Yeah, very good. And they've been successful. It's been a successful venture on the part of BFI people. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it, it's encouraging that. We have other entities that do that. We have a lot of research institutions, mm -hmm. uh, government and otherwise and so forth, who would be trying to take a look at things in that comprehensive way. But they also tend to be um, specialized yeah. by and large. The whole research enterprise or the human enterprise is specialized, and he made reference to that kind of thing often, did he not? Yeah, absolutely. That, uh, <laughs> I think he saw it as our evolutionary downfall. <laughs> he made, <laughs> he yeah, I think so, and it may be relevant. He said <laughs> that the masters who run the world, they think comprehensively, and uh, that it's a divide and conquer thing, that uh, they get the best minds coming up so specialized out on one thing yeah. that they'll never think comprehensively or yeah. systems yeah. and become a threat to those who are running the world. Yeah. That's a little bit of a... Uh, it's an interesting take on things. There may be some truth there. Well, I mean, I think a great example is climate change. I mm -hmm. mean, that the complexities of global changes have been reduced basically to CO2, Yeah. right? Yeah. And so the ways in which people try to quantify the, the, the relative value of certain activities is how much CO2 it releases. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's important, there's but also it's methane. also, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, yeah. there's, yeah, there's a, a lot, lot of other things, things involved. Yeah, not yeah. only methane, it's yeah. not only, you know, carbon yeah. dioxide, yeah, right. it, it's, it's all kinds of um, phenomena that are constantly interacting. And, right. and I think that the trick now, the challenge before us mm. is how do we begin to balance this hyper-specialization with very compelling ways to help people think in the big picture. To the big picture on to comp as I said to you in our little chat we were having before, yeah. I refer to him often in my literature that I'm putting out about we did an interview back in seventy four with him right. and I say he was a comprehensivist and the spell check comes up, no such word. <laughs> no such word. You yeah. know, it's just kind of interesting, <laughs> sure. isn't it? There, you can't be or I've suggested a university should have a department of everything. Yeah. Or there's an autodidactic thing coming now in the world that's making it possible for people to become comprehensive and si systems thinking rather right. than specialized. But it's Gallup, particularly with linear regression in the computer, is specialization yeah. is thought of as the way to go. 
And uh, that, that's the thing that ought to be addressed well, in, I, in terms of education writ large. Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's promising because a lot of people have recognized the absolute necessity of whole systems thinking, whole systems design. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the work of Amory Lovins, you yeah. look at the work that, you know, you have Schumacher was doing. I mean, like, there, there are a number of people that mm -hmm. have recognized the absolute importance of taking the, the largest possible frames of reference into right. account so that we can understand all of these complex interactions much right, more thoroughly. Right. And that it's, it's still, I, I still think it's relatively nascent within academia because it's so counter to the ways in which academia has evolved. Mm -hmm. And so that, it, so for me, it's, it's been necessary to find a, a praxis yeah. and, and demonstrations of this mm -hmm. so that the conversation can be grounded mm -hmm. because you can't, you know, it's very difficult to talk about everything. <laughs> well, no, but, <laughs> but, but because it's difficult doesn't mean it's ipso facto absurd. Right, absolutely. That it, it, it is a, 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 an ontology or epistemology or a yeah. way of understanding yeah. things. And it's also, um, I had a friend of mine who took AOL public, right, when they went, and his dad was in the room with Norbert Wiener. Mm -hmm. When they coined the term of the dozen guys or so, cyber, mm -hmm. means steersman yeah, for a yeah, cyber. Sure. And in information, information overload permits pattern recognition. Absolutely. We're being inundated every day, David. There comes a revolution over the transom from every field in yeah. terms of our understanding. 30 years ago, we didn't know the way the brain worked. We didn't know the neuro, you know, neurotransmitters. We didn't know the genome. Mm -hmm. It's coming to a time of a, like a quickening yeah. of understanding in an intellectual way the realities of the world that we just simply haven't had access to over our 200,000 year sojourn yeah. as a species, yeah. right? Can you get your mind on that? Does that make sense to you? It does, except that I, I do think that sometimes the, the sheer novelty yeah. of that gestalt yeah. coming in gestalt, yeah. can be itself a distraction. Okay. Because I think a lot of times when people are talking about the futures and yeah. within future studies and things, there can almost be this kind of technological fetishism uh -huh. that people are hoping that these new technologies are just going to come along and save us from ourselves. Yeah. Right? And right. that a lot of the, the research that, that I've done in terms of sort of the history of humans projecting their imaginations yeah. onto the dome and right. the relationship that we've had with ecological cycles in the sky and everything, mm -hmm. that there's an extraordinary amount of wisdom to be found in ways that our ancestors have synchronized with the cycles of life, yeah. right? And, and been able to deal with the paradox of and what no, it means to be an organism within an environment. Absolutely. And, and all of these different kind of cultural mechanisms right. that have encouraged people to think long term. That right. have encouraged, you know, the, the simplest example kind of being the, the seven generations kind of eating. Yes, right. right. No. And that within our particular culture, mm -hmm. we don't actually have a lot of those structures in place anymore. That we're constantly, we're actively encouraged to be extraordinarily myopic okay. and to think in terms of quarterly profits and to think in terms of our own personal satisfaction. R right. And that it's almost impossible for us, most of us to even imagine 50 years, 100 years, yeah. let alone, you know, in the case of the Long Now Foundation, you know, 10,000 yeah, years out. Yeah, I love that. Out, yeah, right? yeah, right, right. And, and so I think our, our, our biggest challenge mm. is how are we developing ways in which we're encouraging people to think long term? Mm -hmm. Because we're only here because our ancestors took consideration for mm -hmm. what was coming That's you know, right. after them. I mean, and no matter what's happening, I mean, uh, what, no matter what's happening, we will want to anchor to history yeah. or the historical context. Uh, it's almost necessarily scientifically to be able to do that. Four million years ago, we weren't here. There was Australopithecine. We were contained within Australopithecine. It's an evolving pattern that we can come to understand. We were in a different form. I would we say. were in a different <laughs> we were form. Here, but <laughs> well, it's interesting there. Or and then we, you know, and we get to this point. And um, Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould were talking about punctuated equilibrium yeah. and the way in which you have the new appear. Yeah. And we got uh, we now have people who are understanding how the evolutionary process got started. Yeah. And we're coming to a new kind of relationship. And um, that's something that's very worthwhile taking account of, maybe thinking very comprehensively in terms of the physics that are, we just yeah. got Brian Greene and string theory mm -hmm. to question the special theory of relativity that had informed physics mm -hmm. and all of this. And so it's coming, it's something that this is not your normal time. People probably have thought that, but I really think it may be a time like a gestation mm. or something of that order 
that we're coming to now. I don't know if you get a sense of that or if it's necessary that we do get a sense of that which would give us a comprehensive uh, understanding of the context within one that we anchor to history but you're going to subsume in a certain sense mm. that and then the new, a new kind of relationship to the cosmos is going to be what would emerge. I, I don't know if you can understand what I'm saying but this is not your normal time. I, I agree. I mean, you do okay. the, ab absolutely. I mean, there's there's an, ex an amazing amount of acceleration that's occurring with yeah, regards it's to like a quickening in a pregnancy. But yeah. this, uh, again, I, I I'm very cautious. Yeah. Okay. Of, Good. Of placing it in too much of a moment of novelty. Okay. Because I think yeah. the danger is that we have gotten in some ways so abstracted yeah. from our lived existence. Okay. That, for instance, you know, our, our cosmological speculations yeah. are predicated on, you know, uh, particle colliders, right? Yeah, Trying yeah. to understand the nature of dark matter and searching for these. Yeah, I mean, it's thrown them into a loop now. Right. Think about well, dark matter and so much of it. Is I know. I, I, another mystery. Another mystery. mystery yeah. More paradoxes. Yeah, yeah. And I think that what it is, you know, to some degree, we have to become more comfortable with the fact that we are organisms within. An ecology mm -hmm. that, as we start to understand our, mm -hmm. our our ecological surroundings from the bioregional perspective all yeah. the way up to the cosmic right. perspective, right. that we have to take responsibility for working within the regenerative capacity of those ecologies. Right. right? Absolutely. And and that the problem with becoming too enamored with the novelty and the acceleration right. yeah. is that it's very easy to once again kind of abstract ourselves yeah, out right, of right. the cycles, right, 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 to see it as a linear progress. And, yeah. and I think that the, the there's since you know the, the past couple of centuries at least, yeah. there's been this very very strong myth of progress mm -hmm. that things are yeah. you know getting better and better and better. Right, right. But at the same time, you know we're seeing rapid destabilization of a number of the planetary Absolute ecosystems. Sustainable and, questions are arising all over the place, right. aren't they? And and so I think that it's, it's very important to achieve some level of balance, or at least strive for some level of balance. Yeah. Yeah. when it comes to appreciating the fact that there are many, many, many things that we could be doing, mm -hmm. um, especially with industrial processes like agriculture and yeah. manufacturing, right. that fit much more within the cyclical and regenerative nature of this particular planet that yeah. we're on yeah. and the things that we've taken for granted for right. so long. I mean, one of the beauties of science is yeah. that you know, we, for 10,000 years, we've taken the relative stability of the atmosphere for granted, yeah, right? Yeah. Hadn't really had to think about it. Right, right. Didn't even know to didn't think about it. Didn't have the means of measuring it. <laughs> exactly. Knowing. Yeah, right. And, and so since this material is coming along so quickly, yes. I think part of what the, the challenge has been is that scientists are realizing, like, oh, my goodness, we've got these parts per million of CO2, and that's mm. being completely stabilized. And they're trying to uh, relate this information to a general public in such mm. a way mm -hmm. that is hoping that everyone is a self-interested rational actor. Well, that's right? something that comes up in economics too. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> that's the foundation of a lot of the assumptions we have yeah. is that the economic models have been predicated on the modernist epistemological assumptions. Uh -huh. There's that, not nearly that, enough. That, 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 well, it's based it's on scarcity, scarcity of, yeah. course, of course. Yeah. So like this Malthusian and, idea of scarcity yeah. and that the ways in which we interact with environments mm -hmm. is it's simultaneously, and this is the grand paradox, I think, of these infinite growth paradigms. It's yeah. based on scarcity, but it's going to grow forever. Uh -huh. like, how does that uh, work? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I mean, a conundrum. Yeah, a conundrum. Right? It's yeah, a fundamental yeah, yeah. flaw in yeah. the system. Yeah. And so what, what Fuller was getting to that I found to be so interesting was right. that he, would, he was insisting that by understanding these larger frames of reference working and within them working and within appreciating them, them appreciating ecologically, them yeah. that we can cultivate synergies uh -huh, so right. that we can begin to design a world that yes. really would work for everybody. And he, he designed a lot of things that were based upon the uh, design of nature yeah, at a molecular level. Absolutely. And so he designed these things in keeping with that. I'd like to just throw in quickly a thing about, I'm sorry to have to announce that our leading biologist we just found out that Lynn Margulis, Margulis had yeah. passed. It's a sad business that she had passed. And uh, I, I'm sorry to mention that, uh, but... Uh, and she was a comprehensivist herself. I mean, she was she, a comprehensivist, yeah. and she also was in league with Mr. Lovelock mm. and the idea of Gaia, Gaia. Yeah. the idea of Gaia where you draw off and see the Earth as an organism mm -hmm. developing and that mm -hmm. kind of thing, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of hard scientist people think that gets into mysticism mm -hmm. or something that they're very uh, 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 loath to do, yeah. you know?
well, if the cells in my body become self-aware, they might think it's mystical that I would consider me a biological entity. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I right, mean? Right, right, <laughs> right. It's yeah. kind of what scale do you choose yeah. to, to draw that line? Right. I mean, the, the, that's something that I'm, I'm constantly intrigued by is when you look at, for instance, mycelial networks in forests, right? Uh -huh, yeah. And the function that the mushrooms yeah, serve in decomposing and everything. It's like, okay, these boundaries that we draw yeah. around organisms and concepts yeah. or even galaxies, yeah. you know, these are conceptual constructs we yeah. have. We have to constantly remind ourselves, like, we're piecing all of this together yeah. in the way that we can based on our own cultural entrainment and yeah, based yeah. on our own perceptions. Yeah. And so... There's, there's kind of a hard line, I think, sometimes within yeah. science that yeah. can be hypercritical for the sake of it without yeah. really uh, possibly, you know, uh, looking at some of these proposals in ways that they, they might actually be useful framing devices. Yeah, right. Even right. if they're, they're not absolutely as rigidly defined. But then again, you look at, like, the definition of what's the rigid definition of life. Yeah, you know, I mean, right. like, these things are a constant conundrum. Right, right, right. I mean, that's really good. And not to keep uh, going on that thing, but she, she, was, uh, she was beautiful. And she was, coming to, she was coming to voice a great deal of um, upset with the challenges to the, sci to the rigor hmm. of the scientific process itself because it was becoming politicized. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting thing. She was becoming very worried about that mm. in terms of the peer review and the mm -hmm. institutions that exist and so forth. Mm. And I wonder if we could come around to Fuller. I, I mentioned it to you before. We now come up with string theory in terms of physics, and it questions or it brings into question, we've got the W map, as you say, three, what, 300,000 years after the occurrence of the Big Bang, 13.7 billion. That's a heck of a measure, being able to take the measure, ability to take the measure of things, mm -hmm. characteristic. And we had the, uh, the accelerator the, at CERN. They were going to take a telescope array that didn't get financed, I guess, or something. But they were going to take the picture of the shock wave within a nanosecond of its occurrence, 13.7 mm. billion years ago. It's in place. Mm. And we have a capability that is incredible mm. in terms of what our systems will allow us to, sure. to do. But the, with the string theory, it comes into whether this is a universe or multiple universes, calls into question the second law of thermodynamics, that the, all systems move toward entropy to the limit of the system. If it is or is not a closed system, which is a conundrum that keeps us well in a synergistic understanding of all the reality, if you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. But Fuller used to cast about for what's it all about in terms of evolution or the existence of all the realities. And he felt that the evolutionary process itself from the beginning of RNA and then the evolutionary process was an anti-entropic function in universe that moved across entropy and brought increased patterns of conscious understanding to the process of which we are a part within an evolutionary context within the universe. Increasing Does that levels make, of novelty and complexity. Yeah. Yes, indeed, and, and of, at levels of speciation. Yeah. Does that make sense, or do, does that make sense to you, and does that hold, and if it does, does that give us an understanding of how we can view the larger issues within a context that takes into account the, the systems by which... He wanted to get to a thing where he said we could get an operating manual for Spaceship Earth. He's written beautifully on that, to where we have a comprehensive context. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sure. That we could get to that kind of a thing, and are we approaching where we would have a context that could, could get us to that level of understanding and this understanding of his understanding of evolution and the human role within the evolutionary process within the cosmos. I think only through practice. Practice, I mean, right. I, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool pragmatist. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I think that trying to get to this abstractly mm -hmm. and purely through theory is, mm. it, 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 it's not feasible. Okay. That if we really want to see and understand these evolutionary processes at work and to yeah. self-consciously apply, I think it was uh, Charles Sanders Peirce that called them the, yeah. the habits of nature, okay, right? He didn't yeah. refer to the laws of nature, yeah. but they were these kind of successful habits. Habits, that's and, an interesting and, word. And to pick up on what those habits are mm -hmm. and to understand these phenomena from an, um, the perspective of emergent properties and increasing complexity and increasing novelty and understanding that the, the synergistic properties that emerge from these systems are something that we can consciously cultivate, mm -hmm. that there's things that we can recognize. Instead mm -hmm. of kind of trying to tear everything apart and then uh -huh. reconstruct it from the ground up, yeah. to see that 
there's so much that's already happening yeah. that we aren't responsible for. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that there yeah, are all yeah. of these natural processes yeah. and cycles and systems. Yeah. And that when you see human beings operating within that to, to kind of gently you know, provide a situation in mm -hmm. which centropic effects, synergistic yeah. effects yeah. can be maximized, yeah. that it's incredibly inspirational yes. when it comes to understanding what human beings can do. Yeah. And so one of, one of Fuller's primary tenets was that you know, we're exquisite problem solvers yeah. as a species. Yeah. And that we have this particular corner of our universe that has all of these various synergistic effects that mm -hmm. enable us to sit here and have this conversation and yeah. breathe the air and we have the right gravity and mm -hmm. the magnetosphere. I mean, you can yeah. kind of go on and on and on about all the things that have to happen in order for us to even be able to sit here uh -huh. and have this conversation. Also and, at a very crucial moment. And a crucial moment. I mean, temporally, absolutely. Yeah. And so what, what I hope we can accomplish with the Buckminster Fuller Challenge is mm. by focusing attention on those crucial issues mm. that need to be focused on, on, a, on a global scale right now, mm -hmm. as well as the processes that are cultivating the, the synergistic emergent properties uh -huh. so that we can begin to heal so many of the systems that are being destabilized uh -huh. and that are, are really being disrupted mm -hmm. in, in so rapidly mm -hmm. that it's, it's difficult to actually grasp the extent to which they could have a profoundly negative effect on humanity, you know, from, from here on out. Well, the interesting thing in that, if I may, is that you have a unique capability of extending consciousness into the universe mm. through tools and t technology. Mm -hmm. And that's coming to a point where the extension of that has been at the benefit within the historical context of uh, weapon systems mm -hmm. were used by one tribe to gain an advantage over another so they could go and conquer and be, make their tribe strong. It's called realpolitik and mm. that sort of thing. Still it seems to apply. Mm. And the weapon systems have, according to the modeling uh, that I can come across, is the weapon systems that have finally been developed by this process of extended consciousness uh, to where they, they reach the point where they're species lethal. That is, they mm. have the ability to eliminate the Homo sapiens species. Do you think that's true? Was it true? It, it, 70 comes up the year when they mostly think we reached that Armageddon point, mm. which uh, relates to the Second World War, we could not. Mm. We were trying, but we were not. But that the weapon systems are species lethal. Well, we're so that it's, it, you're talking about cutting off conscious evolution yeah. or evolutionary process, at least in terms of conscious, at this extent, so that's very crucial. And then also Fuller used to, he did, if I may, he took with the, uh, I don't know if it's a science design decade or what, but he had that chart that he made saying that the percentage of the world population in terms of capability was increasing through time, you're familiar mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. It's 10% by the First World War, 20% mm -hmm. by the Second. Mm -hmm. And he said we were heading hyperbolically yeah. toward where there would be, we would cross the 50% mark and he lived out his life thinking we had crossed at the level of capability mm. for providing life support for yeah. the whole of the human society yeah, and the, the ecology yeah. and the ecology. We had a capability that we were crossing and he held, let out his, lead, he lived out his life thinking we crossed that 50% mark yeah. in terms of world population with an ecological around the year 1970. Yeah two things at the same time, existentially significant. Yeah. What do you make of all that? Well, I think it's interesting when you look back at the predictions that he was making with okay. regards to sort of what, what he saw coming in the next few decades. That would be, in when a sense, transcending, in a certain sense, the limitations of, of perceived world that is scarce yeah. in terms of abundant, yeah. in terms of ephemeralization, doing more yeah, with less through less, good design yeah, yeah. so that w people would be able to transcend a world in which scarcity had been a reigning ontology or epistemology yeah. to one where we could be opening on a thing where there would be enough. Yeah, and so the question is why didn't that take hold? Well, it could be that it, we've been wandering <laughs> in the wilderness for 40 years and it is this challenge before I, us. I think so. I mean, he did talk a lot about gestation rates and mm -hmm. he had great hopes mm -hmm. that 
uh, the politicians would prove themselves as useless as they seem to be today, mm -hmm. uh, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know his notion of gestation rates, especially as you mentioned towards the end of his life, he started writing quite a bit On about politics. The, the, the gross universal cash heist and and critical these, path. And critical path. Critical of path is beautiful book. And, and and I think that right now we are seeing such explicit examples about what he was talking about. I think so. That that there's a lot of material to mine that by by his own uh, quantification of what you were referencing in terms of you know world capacities and world needs that there's a tremendous amount to be learned right now in terms of trajectories that we can be taking because of the I think the deeply emergent uh, initiatives that are happening around the planet where yeah. people are getting them Paul Hawken writes about this extensively yeah, right, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. That, you see all of these efforts going on. Uh -huh. People are looking for some kind of common language. Yeah. That you know, in the past few months, of course, like Occupy has been very interesting because yeah. it's focused people's attention not on politics mm -hmm. but on the actual core of the system that's driving yeah. the politics. They keep going horizontal, yeah. more yeah. and more inclusive, rather yeah. than I mean, getting out on one specialization. That's encouraging. It is encouraging, it yeah. and I think it's I think it's mm -hmm. very very interesting. And that, uh, and I actually just think that it demonstrates the extent to which. Fuller's reckonings are more relevant than ever. I at wouldn't this point. agree with you more. And yeah. I th and so part of what I would really like to see happen is, and, and part of what we're working on at BFI is yeah. to engage a lot of thinkers right now, especially uh -huh. that are very very active in the realms of you know uh, social innovation and social capital and, and entrepreneurship uh -huh. and uh, people that are working with all kinds of ecology and agriculture and sociology. I mean, to look at some of the fundamental ideas that Fuller had and mm -hmm. the relevance that those have to today. Because I think in a lot of ways, when he was proposing this, a, a lot of these ideas back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Yeah, well, he, 52, they, they were, he, he copyrighted that chart. Yeah. Where he projected ahead to 72 and he said he had accelerated. Yeah. And he lived out his life saying 1970 was a marker time. Yeah, yeah. Both destruction and p new potential that's right. opening at the level of capability. Right. But you got all the inherited institutions that were formulated in one condition, you're making a gigantic transformation yeah. from one where there's not nearly enough through good design, ephemeralization, doing more with less, providing for everyone is different than being a condition that was at one uh, ontologically was one of scarcity. And you asked me what I make of that, and yeah. that was two years before I was born. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but you can <laughs> you, know, you can incorporate. So, but but uh, but the, yeah. for, for for me, it's interesting. I was looking at a bunch of EPA pictures the other day. I think yeah. They were posted on Boing oh. Boing about you know Im images uh, of of kind of environmental degradation going on yeah. the year that I was born. You know, yeah, and I was yeah. thinking to myself because I was sitting there with my my young nephew. Like wow, we are we are born into this world. Mm -hmm. We are born into this system, mm -hmm. and we're sort of forced to play the game whether we want to or not. Yeah. You know, or or we make the choice to or uh -huh. not. Uh -huh. And and for me, the looking back and I mean, because I never met Fuller. You know, I, yeah. I know him only through his, his family and through his writings and yes. things. Yes. But for me, it's just he 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 really provides one of the more interesting lifelong experiments uh -huh. of what does it mean to really try to understand the true human capacity for designing a world in which we are operating within the successful habits of the universe. That's right, and we can you know? present patterns that could be understood by increasing numbers of people, it would seem. I think it's widely understood. And if you've got that kind of an opportunity, then you would be able to have something that could be not only just to go to the poets mm. and so forth, a liberating mm. of the people who have been uh, ensconced within an order that wasn't able to, to really realize their full potential in any kind of full sense mm. or something. Uh, the mass of the people within an ecological context doing more with less mm. through good design. Mm. We have these capabilities mm. now, and it would be a challenge, the ultimate challenge of tensional integrity, top, mm. uh, geodesic and there's intentional integrity that goes through molecularly and so forth, informing the whole. Mm -hmm. And it would be, might be able to provide the context where not only would it be liberating the people who have not been in a good leadership position or something of that sort, historically or politically or something, but it would be something that could be understood by anchoring it to the historical institutions and going along with those responsible for the outdated institutions mm -hmm. which are manifest when you make that kind of a transformation. And we need something that can be understood by and gone perhaps haltingly by some, yeah. but gone along with yeah. by everybody because it's comprehensively got integrity that goes through the whole at another level. Can, 
You understand the what key I'm saying? Is the that, key, it includes uh, everybody. The key is the practice, uh -huh. and the key okay, is the, the, new, the, the, the new models, uh -huh. right? That it isn't just critiquing the existing model. Exactly. That that's you, a political thing. That's that people, the political who's thing. Who's the bad do. guy? Everybody's know, looking I mean, for the bad guy. You look at the news cycle. Yeah, we're all in this. Ninety-eight percent yeah, of it is just, just these absurd distractions right. of these these very peculiar personality well, we're, types. We're, we ought to be a little things. easy with ourselves because we've been living in a world where everybody's trying to find who the bad guy is yeah. to fight politically yeah. and to have the idea that yeah. there's a context, ontologic context that is transcendent to mm, that mm. is something that might be able to be the, the test of whether we, in a certain sense, evolutionarily, yeah. make it, yeah. as he said, yeah. to a synergistic resonancy of a liberated humanity and world yeah. that will inter-accommodate us to universe at a level transcendent at a species level to the universe. That's mouthful. We may be, we <laughs> may be at a time of incredible do you, know, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Absolutely. Because those weapons remain species lethal, well, they and they do. don't have a vision that is not historically uh, myopic. But they're not only species lethal for us. Like it's we're, the whole we're, we're, we're losing so many species every day well, on that's this planet. True. You know? And so part of the issue, I think, is one of focus, and that many people aren't even aware of the impact that we're having on the global systems that we're right. dependent on, so that we're having all these interdependencies and interoperabilities between all these different species on the planet that we've been taking for granted this whole time. That's you know? true. So when externalities, you start, externalities, we call them. Exactly. Yeah. Hazel so you, Anderson, God bless her. Exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. when you start talking about the collapse of the oceans, and you start talking about you know the, the forests and the, all the these you know, so-called ecosystem services being provided by all of these systems, that that's where the communications capacity that we have Thank now you. Back to is, the beginning. is, is yeah. so powerful. Yeah, yeah. Because we can start to help people to understand. It's very, 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 very difficult to understand these things just by reading about them. But if you can visualize them. A light show. Help, yeah, a light <laughs> show, right? <laughs> I mean, right. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah. really Multime is sensorial. Absolutely. And start, yeah. and start to work within the full capacity that we have for visual cognition and Thank for all you. Of these different you know modes that we have as a species and that's that coming really that's coming exponentially in new mm. dimension mm. really quickly because all the revolutions are coming out of the computer labs mm. and those are all going exponential now our capability i mean look at what gaming technology has done in and of itself yeah. i mean uh -huh. it's phenomenal what the capacities are but it's it's equally phenomenal how how trivial so many of the applications are, right? Do you that, think? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. The game. I don't have much to do with that, but you yeah. know. But anyway. But um, do you think the idea of design would go to things? And I don't. I know we don't want. Uh, people have suggested uh, serious people who are looking at you know the contemporary moment and so forth. He said the idea of design isn't designed just to some new technology or some new gadget or some machine or something. It's a design at the level of economic theory mm -hmm. or a, a new design principles or an operating manual, as he said, he, he led to, Fuller did, mm. that it's a design thing to design the political and not to avoid the political economic, yeah. engage, it engage it and be involved with it and bring new design principles to the context within which that is gone to where you could engage that political class of people who are people that want to be engaged and in the idea that it would be something that everybody would be able to go along with. Absolutely. You, you understand? Have the model. Absolutely. Because it's all caught up within dialectics yeah. when it should be within, you know, things relevant to the emerging future. Well, and I think, you know, at the simplest level, you know, the, the, the whole notion of the paradigm. Paradigm you know, of paradigm. Ca came from, yeah. you know, Kuhn. Tom, Thomas Kuhn discussing yeah. this geocentric to the heliocentric ship, right? right? Yeah, and, that was and a biggie. That was a biggie, but mm. now we actually have this new model that Carter's been working on called yeah. the Digital Universe Atlas, and, and Earth, Earth yeah. is, Earth is yeah. at the center, uh -huh. and we're surrounded by the celestial sphere we call the cosmic microwave. Yeah, microwave, right, right, right. And right. so what is, like, for me, I, this is what I, I'm endlessly fascinated by. Yeah. Like, how do you interpret that? Mm -hmm. Like, what, like, not only is it this incredible cosmic irony that the entire you know, logic of uh -huh. the Western world. Of the whole it, world. That has emerged, that, of the whole the world whole now, world, yeah. exactly. I we mean, were in one but, condition, just like we were all still pisses yeah, and we became yeah. something else, we're coming something else. But in, in, in a very real sense, what we've come to is the realization that Earth is actually the ecological center of our universe. Yes, indeed. You know, okay, and, yeah. that, and that yeah. for, for a long time, we've been trying to escape this embodied reality, mm -hmm. to become objective observers, to look at it from this God's eye view, mm -hmm. and 
this new model of an uh, uh, astrophysicist friend that worked on developing this with Carter, he, back of the napkin sketch, he says he thinks it's about $10 billion worth of missions and research to create this new model of the universe, right? Wow. And so okay. it sort of it symbolizes uh -huh. this quest uh -huh. to create our objective view on the cosmos, right. where in fact, we are situated in the exact center of it. Uh -huh. And in order to understand that, you have to really look at it from a paradoxical perspective. Right. That, that like the center is everywhere and nowhere simultaneously. Yeah, right, 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 right. And that suspension what, of judgment. Exactly. Yeah, suspension right. of belief in yeah, a lot of Yeah, ways. right. And it, not disbelief. Very suspension important belief. beliefs to a lot of Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so I think that what the realization that we are coming around to, in spite of our efforts to find the perfect, you know, exoplanet to go yeah. colonize yeah. and alien life and everything, that what if the conditions, the synergistic conditions that have developed in such a way to en enable complex embodied consciousness to exist on this planet yeah, right. really are the only game in town for the foreseeable future. Uh, How do we act? Uh -huh. What do we do? Uh, right. And when we ask all of these, these you know, abstract philosophical questions, what if they're actually much more practical than that? Uh -huh. That if we really want to colonize space, if we really want to see humanity flourish, that liberate, the first, liberate. Liberate. That the first thing we have to do is actually come to terms with where we are. Right. And the regenerative right. cycles yeah. that we have to really work within and uh -huh. cultivate yeah. as a species. Uh -huh. And this is our test. Yeah. This is our test on a cosmic scale That's as a what species I'm to see After if we can grow up and if we can actually become responsible enough to take full responsibility for our own initiatives on this planet so that we're operating within the confines and boundaries and possibilities of what this represents. It's final exam time on planet Earth for this consciousness. And it's yeah. there. And where we're going to go for a d c curriculum yeah. is you and Carter and some of the things <laughs> that people are doing. Because these uh, new ways of communicating, yeah. you know, and, 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 and making education. Uh, consciousness raising mm. is what it would be mm. uh, will are re really important and I just wish you all the very best with all of that I really enjoyed talking to you and everything I think it's an amazingly uh, significant moment to be have been born into this particular time the the challenges are amazing and how we can in the educational implications of what you and Carter and BFI are doing are, 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 are enormous and I really thank you for all that work and wish you all the very best in it as it progresses. You're involved with uh, BFI and you're also involved with NASA yes. and other, uh, are not, uh, other agencies that are trying to get good information out to the mass, uh, to the, not only the leadership but also the body politic. Uh, sure. Uh -huh. Let's hope public access might be able to be one way <laughs> in which some of that could be disseminated which we hope we might have done here. And so it's really good and really good to have met you and to talk with you. And I thank you very, very much for all that good work. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, we could go on talking for about 25 hours. <laughs> uh, and we have to do, we have to, we have Two to more do, minutes. we have to do this. Uh, we have a couple minutes more. Yeah. Uh, what's your plans now? You're here in New York. You're going to mm. be doing that. What's your plans over the next one, two years? What are your priorities? How do you decide your mm. priorities? to spend your time because you're connected in a very important way. You're doing a PhD out of England now mm -hmm. at the University of Plymouth. Mm -hmm. Good place. Mm -hmm. Good thing developing yeah, there. Yeah. Familiar and my, with the Open University yeah, there? Yeah, of course. Okay, yeah, yeah. Work. I mean, my primary focus is a project called the Worldviews Network mm -hmm. um, where I'm working with science centers around the country that's been funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration yeah, good. to work with science centers to help to contextualize global changes for people from a cosmic, a global, and a bioregional scale right. to really engage communities in dialogues right. so that we can understand what do we do practically to start addressing some of these daunting challenges. Wonderful. It's great work and yeah, it's so good. So listen, thanks a lot. Thanks <laughs> Thank for you. viewing in the cable audience. It's your pleasure to perceptions of a man who's very, very important. I recommend he'll be, I, 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 I project he's going to be much more made aware of in the general society as a leading educator and person who's helping to bring the planet into good accord with what the universe wants it to be. And I thank you for all that good work and wish you all the very, very best Thanks, in terms of all your work. <laughs> uh, thank you. Tune in. It was always good talk on conversation. Tune in again next week. We'll be coming back once again, uh, David. Thank you really very, very much. Welcome to New York Thanks. and uh, keep up the good work. My pleasure. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Okay.